Brother Aaron's sermon text is John 10, 36, but I'm going to go ahead and read verse 33 through 38. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I say ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him who the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. If I do, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Our dear Heavenly Father, I pray for Brother Aaron, that you will give him good words to say, that he will have clear thoughts, and that all of us that are listening, that we will be able to get much out of it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This text is one of many occasions that the Jews um, butted heads with Jesus. This is a uh, this is an inspired, uh, the record is an inspired argument. And there are other, uh, other times where this uh, happened as well. Uh, the occasion is because the, they, were, they were upset with what Jesus had said about himself. Uh, other places where he said, uh, he said, I am from above, you are from beneath. And they were offended at that statement. And they thought, we know, we know your father and your mother. We know your brethren. Who do, you, who do you think you are? They were offended at this. Jesus said, blessed are they who are not offended uh, in me. Um, they also uh, didn't, uh, didn't like very well when he said, I and my father are one. They said, you blaspheme because you being a man makest thyself God. They, they caught the, the, the import of what he was saying. I and my father uh, are, are one. Uh, they also got, uh, got a little uh, sideways when he, he would touch certain things that were, that were sensitive to them. These were Jewish people, and there were certain things that were, that were Jewish. And they didn't like much uh, when he called out their error about swearing on the, on the gold of the altar, but not the altar, or the gold of the temple, but not the temple. And he, he said, what, what sanctifies what here? It's the gold, it's the temple that sanctifies the gold, it's the altar that sanctifies the, the gold, and, and they, they didn't like that much uh, either. They were, they were also um, put out when he, he said things like, say not to yourselves that we have Abraham to our father. This, t this, was, this touched a, a point of their pride. This touched their heritage. This was disruptive to them. He, he said, God's able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. So don't, don't glory in the fact that, you're, that you can trace your lineage back to uh, Abraham. And he also had the boldness to touch something regarding Moses. And he said, if you were Moses' disciples, you would hear me because Moses wrote of me. And this didn't settle very well. Now we, can, we rejoice in seeing Moses writing of Jesus, but they... They, they wouldn't receive it. They, they couldn't receive that way. Now, when Jesus turned the water into wine, they, they didn't have a problem with that. There were certain things that were, that were accepted. You know, there's a great, great catch of fish at least, at least twice that they didn't, they didn't uh, scheme to stone him after they saw the great catch of, of fish. They, they were okay with that. And it, at one point, even the people decided that they would take him by, and make him king. After he multiplied the bread, they thought that this is this is a great opportunity. We'll take him and make him king. But then, see, when he he told the the lame man that he healed to take up his bed and walk, they weren't going to let that happen. See, that touched that touched something that disrupted their system. It did, it was it was threatening. It, he, this man can't be of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. And it, it, at one point they said, come on another day to be healed. Isn't that a strange thing to say? <clears throat> Jesus caused them, he caused them a lot of trouble. He didn't fit into their system. He, he broke their mold. And in fact, 
they stumbled at the stumbling stone. At his birth, actually, Herod and all Jerusalem were troubled. They were troubled at the wise men. We've come to see him that is born king of the Jews. And they were troubled. Why were they? I wasn't troubled when I heard that Jesus is king. You weren't troubled. You aren't troubled now when you hear that Jesus is king. But all Jerusalem was, they were troubled when they heard about the birth of a king. There's some, there's some irony in this, in this argument that, that happened in John chapter 10. For one, they were in a, a porch of the temple when they, conf- they were uh, discourse, you know, arguing with Jesus about, about this issue. They were in the temple. How ironic is that, that the one who fulfilled all of the imagery of the temple, they're arguing with that one in the temple. They were upset with the one that fulfilled their whole system. They disagreed with it. The, the very structure testified of Jesus. Everything that happened in it that took place, it all had to do with Jesus. And they were arguing with this, with this one. In fact, he was the one that all their prophets wrote about. All th- that long heritage that they, were, that, they were, that they took pride in, it was all pointing to this man. And when that man showed up, they argued with him. <clears throat> this is the one that Moses said should come. This was the seed, capital S, of the woman. This was the son of man that Daniel wrote about in his book. This is the root of Isaiah chapter 53. They're arguing with the sacrifice, the Lamb of God. They're taking up issue with him. God said, out of heaven, in whom I am well pleased, and they are saying that they are displeased with this man. They were scheming to kill the very one they were waiting for. He came to his own, and his own received him not. So what we have in this text here is exactly what the prophets said was going to happen. The builders rejected the head of the corner. The very capstone, the very thing that that would hold the whole building together, God was placing the cornerstone in this eternal structure that he was building and is building, and and the builders rejected it. That, that's why we have this, this argument. You know, have you ever thought about how ironic or how, how pitiful, actually, it was that that night that he was, uh, he was betrayed and he was handed over, the Jewish people, they didn't go into the judgment hall, lest they were, would be defiled and they couldn't eat the Passover. Think about how ironic this is. The great Passover was about to be offered, and they were concerned with the shadow of the Passover, with their heritage, that they might eat the Passover. If, they, if, their, zeal, if their zeal was for God as much as it was for their heritage, they would have recognized that this is the Passover. They asked him to show a sign, but he was a sign. He is a sign. He was born of a virgin. What more do you need? But they ask him for a sign. And they also, earlier, they decided, let's not arrest him on the feast day, lest there be a riot. Like, is anybody thinking, think about this a little further. Why would there be a riot? Because the the people heard him gladly, right? But they they didn't want to arrest him on, on the feast day. This was a feast day that was teaching them about this one, this man, the one that God was setting up to be the savior of the whole world. They, they also, another time that's ironic, they, they marveled that he didn't wash before he ate. They were very meticulous. You know, he, at one point he, he uh, remarked on how they were very detailed oriented in, in their offerings, you know, the tithing of the, of the different uh, things, you know, the spices and the and things. But they, they just pass over issues like, oh, judgment. They just pass over that. And mercy, they just pass over that. And, and who Jesus is, they just passed over that. They marveled that he didn't first wash before he ate when actually he was the only clean one among them. 
they thought that he had broke the Sabbath day when he healed that man and told him to take up his bed and walk. When he actually, this was the Lord of the Sabbath. They, they were upset when the, his disciples took the heads of corn and rubbed them on the Sabbath day as they were walking through the, through the fields. But he fulfilled the, the Sabbath. was uh, Man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. They thought at one point that he had blasphemed because he said, thy sins be forgiven thee, when he is himself forgiveness. He is the only one that can forgive sins. But they judged that he, had, he was blaspheming by saying that thy sins be forgiven him. They, they accused him of being a friend of sinners. He's the only one that could make them not sinners. They thought he had a devil, and he's the only man that the devil had nothing in. They, all, of, all of these things tell us how he was received or not received by the Jews. They, were, they had this argument with him, and Jesus, he, he pointed out this, the, the one whom God hath sanctified. Jesus is the one whom God hath sanctified. Now, this word, would it would strike a chord in in the Jewish mind. This was, this was not a strange word to them. They could, they could turn in their scrolls, in the law, and in the prophets, and they could give a, a discourse. They could teach about the, how things were to be sanctified, what was sanctified, why it was sanctified, because everything that God used had to be sanctified. So this, this wasn't a, a, a strange word to them, but it was strange that Jesus was talking about a man being sanctified. They didn't know, they knew the word sanctified, but they didn't know him who was sanctified. Now just a, an effort to, uh, to define and to, to build this, uh, the, the truth that is invested into this word. You know, sanctification is one of those words that the world hasn't bo borrowed. It's borrowed the word faith and changed it into something that, that it doesn't mean, and it's borrowed the word hope and used it in ways that it, that it shouldn't be used, and love, and, and we could say that about a lot of words, but I don't, I don't hear anyone borrowing the word sanctification. It, it, so it, it, the Lord, he, cre he creates words for his, for his own use. It's like he, uh, th this is, he, he made the world in order to carry, you know, in order to uh, work out and to unfold salvation. So sanctification has to do with, with holiness. There's nothing that is sanctified but not accepted. There's nothing that's sanctified but defiled. Sanctification, it, something has to be holy to be sanctified. Or you could say it the other way, that in sanctification, it's made holy. It, it's, it's purified. It's without, it's without contamination. It's without stain. It's not marred. It's consecrated. That is, it's, it's given over. For something to be given over to God, it's got to be holy. It's got to be pure. Amen. It's got to be acceptable to him, to be given over to him and to be accepted and received by him. But, the, and that, that's what consecrate, consecrated to God. That is, it belongs to him. It's not multi-purpose. You know, they, a lot of structures these days are, are built for multi-purpose reasons. They, we do, we do a... <laughs> A lot of different things in the same room, but God, God never did this, you know. There wasn't like a recreation day in the tabernacle. It was consecrated. It was venerated to, to God and to his services, to his purpose. It's to hallow. That's something that is rather foreign to our, to our culture today, something that is hallowed. It's not common. It's, it, it's not for everyday use for any type of, of, of use or treatment. It's, it's hallowed. See, that has to do with sanctification. When it comes to people being sanctified, is they're, they're clean, they're made pure, they're, they're perfected. That is, whatever is sanctified, it's not, sanctification is not a process in order to sit it on the shelf. It's not just for, not just for viewing. It's not just a formality just to 
just for the record. You know, there are some things that are, that are just, it's more about the paperwork than it is anything else. Once the paperwork's done, then it's, it's pretty much done. That's, that's what I mean by a formality. Sanctification is not like that. When san- sanctification is initiated and, and worked and accomplished in order for it to be, for, for that person or thing to be used, to be employed by God, Amen. to set apart as sacred, that's sanctification. To anoint, there was all kinds of things in the, uh, under the law, the prophets would anoint, you know, Samuel, he was sent to David, he anointed him. He anointed him king. That was David at a young age being set apart by that anointing. The anointing indicated God's, God's uh, choice, his selection, his will, his purpose. That's all involved in, in sanctification. And to dedicate something. When something's sanctified, it's dedicated dedicated unto God. Like Hannah bringing um, uh, Samuel. Hannah bringing, she, she dedicated him. She gave him over. He was, he was sanctified. He was given over to the Lord. That's, that's like a real life, life uh, image or picture of, of sanctification. It's a special purpose for a specific design and use. It's not that God uses it for this, but somebody else uses it for something else. That means it's been, it, so what is sanctified is not shared for many uses. It's God's. It belongs to him, sanctified. We use the word sanctity, like the sanctity of life, the sanctity of marriage. So we, this is the way God made it. God gives life. There's a sanctity to life. God gives marriage. There's a sanctity to marriage, and that those things are not to be used for, for other things. That's, that's what sanctification is, is all about. Now, n- nothing that God sanctifies goes unused. You know, we've, in ma- manufacturing, we uh, men, you know, make, make loads and loads of stuff, and it, it may, may not be used. be warehoused and shipped and, and never, never be used, it's, and, it, and it's wasted. Well, God... God doesn't work like that. God doesn't do that. He sanctifies and he, and he uses. But also, God doesn't, for his, for his holy purposes or for redemption, he doesn't use something that's not sanctified. It, it, works, it works both ways. Now, there, we could make an exception to that, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, is that God used Pharaoh, right? He raised him up for his own purpose, but that was a different kind of work. God doesn't give the new birth to someone, and then use that, that person who's born again, use them like he did Pharaoh. Uh, so I'm talking about sanctification use in being in the, in the redemptive economy, in fellowship with God. It's sanctified for his, uh, for his use. In fact, the law taught us this, that everything associated with God had to be sanctified. It belongs to him. It's for his purpose. That is, another way of saying this is that God doesn't have any rental vessels. God doesn't, uh, you know, just borrow and use and give it back. He doesn't have a subcontractor agreement to uh, just, you know, sub, sub out the uh, services to, to someone else. He, he sanctifies. It, that means it's his completely. His name is Jealous. God is a jealous God, and he's right to be jealous because it's all his. He is above all. <clears throat> to provide some contrast to help us understand what sanctification is, the, like the opposite of sanctification is to desecrate. It's to make something unusable when something is unfit, to, to de- deface something. Can't be used. That it's, it's rejected. Has no use. There was a woman who followed the Apostle Paul around saying, these be men of the Most High God who show unto us the way of salvation. And after a while, Paul rebuked the Spirit. It wasn't a couple days. I mean, this, wasn't, this didn't go on for like 10 minutes. This went on for some time. And Paul turned, and you, you, you sense that there was some agitation in Paul's spirit about this, about this thing. He didn't, he didn't capitalize on it until this, this woman was, uh, was, was used for profit by, by these people, by these men. And he didn't say, would you take her to the other side of town and we'll kind of maximize the exposure here, you know, so more people will hear 
about our purpose and about our message, and then, and then we'll come behind you, right? No. Paul, that was an unsanctified vessel. And he rebuked that spirit, and it came out and caused a lot of trouble because now the, those men's hopes of profit were gone. But Paul did that because God doesn't use sanctified vessels, unsanctified vessels, for sanctified purposes. In a, in a great house, there are all kinds of different vessels, some for, some for common things and some for holy things. That is, there are vessels we use in the garage, and we don't use those in the kitchen. Nadab and Abihu tried to uh, be themselves unsanctified. They, they, they walked into a, a service, took, took a, a service to themselves that was sanctified and suffered the consequences for it. See, this tells us something about how God uses people and how God uses things. And Nadab and Abihu, they, they, they went over, they, they crossed over the line themselves not being sanctified for this work they took a hold of this work, and God took them out. It's like young David. <clears throat> he put on Saul's armor before, before he went out, and he said, I can't use this. didn't fit. And he said, it's, it's, I haven't proved it. I can't, can't use this. That, that armor wasn't sanctified for the work that David was going to do. And he went out to battle with a, with a sling and and with stones. See, according to nature, this is, this is not advisable. And some of the men even told David this. Saul tried to reason with David about who Goliath was and who David was, and it, just, it didn't change what David did, didn't change how he thought, because David was, he was thinking together with the Lord about this. And he said, the Lord delivered the lion, and he delivered the bear, and he's going to deliver this uncircumcised Philistine into my hand. See, the sling was sanctified for the work that God gave David to do. The armor wasn't. So when the, when Jesus, when the Jews heard Jesus say this about himself, sanctified, him whom God hath sanctified and sent into the world, Here's some examples of things that could have come into their minds as they were uh, disputing with Jesus in the temple. I just, that's just ironic to me that they, they're, they're arguing with the one who fulfilled the temple and they're in the temple and they're arguing with him. But see, the Lord had said, sanctify unto me the firstborn. Sanctify to me the firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. And the Lord had said the, the Sabbath day is sanctified, and he told the people to sanctify the Sabbath day and to, and to keep it. So this wasn't unfamiliar to, uh, to these people. The priests had a process of sanctification. They sanctified themselves, lest the Lord break out and you die. This is like a serious matter. The altar was sanctified by blood. The laver was sanctified by blood. The offerings were sanctified as they were given to the Lord. God sanctified the whole tabernacle. So the Jews knew. He knew. They knew about this sanctification. What they didn't know was about the one whom God sanctified. In fact, the Lord said his name was sanctified. The Lord said that he would sanctify himself in the eyes of all the people so that when men, see, when, when God speaks, it's not, it's not like when, when men speak. That, that's what, when, when the Lord sanctifies himself to the people, then we hear what God says above what other people say. That's, that's sanctified. When God, when God works, it's above what, every, what any other work. God is, God is sanctified in the eyes of the, of the people. In Nehemiah's day, the work of rebuilding the wall, he said he, he sanctified the sheep gate. <laughs> the gate of the, in the wall. He sanctified it. Everything that is given to the Lord was to be sanctified. But see, the, the Jews stumbled at this when Jesus said, Him that God hath sanctified and sent into the world. The Jews, <clears throat> during Paul's day, they were, they were provoked because of uh, Paul. They supposed that Paul had brought this Greek into the, into the, tab the temple. And they said, they defiled this holy place. So they, they understood the basic principle of sanctification. They didn't want anything for anyone foreign that didn't belong 
to them and to the, to the temple. It would defile this holy place. But they couldn't receive this one whom God had sanctified. They had heard John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. A lamb that takes away sin was not unfamiliar to these Jews. But Jesus being the lamb and Jesus taking away the sin of the world, this caused a collision in their, in their minds, in their thinking of a man taking away the sin of the world and being the lamb of God and being sanctified. It was familiar to them because of the law, but it was unfamiliar to them because they, they didn't know this one that had come. He's the Lamb of God. He is the, the sanctified one that God sent into the world. So Jesus was foretold. He was being shadowed by all of these, all of these things under the law and in the tabernacle services that were sanctified. Jesus was foretold, and Jesus fulfilled all of these things. Jesus is above all of the shadows and the promises and the prophecies. He fulfilled them. Think about it, think about it this way, that the, there were tents enough in all of Israel during their time in the wilderness for everyone to, be in a, to live in a tent, to rest in a, in a tent, to sleep in a tent. But there was another tent, a tent of testimony, which was the tabernacle, that was sanctified above all the other tents. So nobody had family reunions in the tabernacle. It was sanctified. It was above the, the common, that, what everybody had. There's hardly been a person in the world who hasn't eaten bread. Bread is a staple, a staple of our livelihood. But there was a showbread that was in that tabernacle. That wasn't for everyone. It was given over to God. It was for a special purpose. It was laid up before God. And every seven days, it was, it was made again fresh and laid up before God. See, that bread was not common like the bread that you and I have in our home. See, Jesus is what he's sanctified by God. You start to get, you start to see what, see, God's prepared us for what he's going, what he's doing in Jesus. He's laid, laid the groundwork. See, Moses, Moses, he was in the desert when he saw that, that uh, the Lord appear in the bush, in the burning bush that wasn't consumed. He was in a desert. There was sand everywhere. There was too much sand to count. There was too much sand to weigh. There was, there was sand everywhere. But when the Lord appeared to him, he said, take off your shoes because that ground is holy. What was that? Why was that ground holy now when there was sand everywhere? It was the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord made that ground holy. It was a, it was a sanctified place so God would give <clears throat> Jesus a work to do and he had to be sanctified to do the work God gave Noah a work to do but the work that Jesus that God gave Jesus to do was of course far greater and far above God gave Jacob a bride he's also giving Jesus a bride God made Moses a deliverer of his generation but God made Jesus, is making Jesus a deliverer of every generation. God gave Solomon wisdom. God made Jesus to be unto us wisdom. Amen. King David was a man after God's own heart. Jesus is a man after God's own image, an exact representation, the brightness of his glory. See, Jesus is sanctified above Everything else that God has given, everything else that God has done, God hath sanctified him. See, I want to exhort you to not stumble at this. Our text is people stumbling at Jesus saying that he's the sanctified one. See, everybody, everybody has to do with Jesus. Nobody can avoid. Nobody can evade. Everyone will have to do with this stone. There are two options. Either you fall on the stone and be broken, or the stone fall, falls on you and you are ground to powder. The gospel means that you can fall and be broken and he'll put you back together again. Aaron was sanctified to stand before God and to represent all the people as high priest. Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. Aaron was prevented from continuing as high priest by, re, by means of death, but Jesus, by the power of an endless life, Amen. 
is bringing many sons unto glory. God sent Joseph to a strange land to save many people alive. God sent Jesus to a strange country to be salvation to us. So Jesus is the sanctified of all that is sanctified. He's sanctified out of what is sanctified. He is hallowed above all that is hallowed. See, all the scriptures testify of him, but he is the word of God. They're testifying of him. He's not like another book of the, of the Bible. He is the word of God. They all testify of him. He's the fulfillment of, in fact, in the Revelation, John saw that his name is written, the word of God. See, there were, there were Levites. There was the, the Levites that were taken out of, the, of the, uh, the tribes of Israel in order to serve the Lord. Well, Jesus is like the Levite taken of the Levites to serve God and to do his will. See, there, were, there, was, a, there was a Nazarite vow that men would take in order to give themselves wholly to the Lord. Well, Jesus is the Nazarite to end all Nazarite vows. He's sanctified of all that is sanctified. See, there were the, there were the 12 apostles that were chosen and sent and given a work to do, but then there was Paul that stands above all of the other apostles. But Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our confession, of our profession. So Jesus is the sanctified of all that is sanctified. See, Jesus, Jesus was born of a woman. All of us have been born of a woman. But Jesus' birth was unlike our birth. He was born of a virgin. And he, his life was unlike any other, other life. He lived and he you know, grew up through uh, childhood and teenage years and, and early 20s and uh, and same, same as I have, right? Well, yes and no. He lived without sin. See, so his life was, was unlike any other life. He, was, he lived above every other, every other life. He was without sin. And he, he died like all other men die, right? Well, he died, but in his death, he was unlike any other men. In his death, he destroyed him who had the power of death. And in his death, he took away sin, by the sacrifice of himself. So even in, in his life, in his birth, in his death, they were all sanctified to God. His birth was used by God like, unlike any other birth. His life was used like God, by God, unlike any other life. And so it was in his death. Even people that didn't understand him, in fact, these were the ones that came to try to trap him in his words. They said, no man ever spake like this man. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't even know how much they'd said. No man ever spake like this man. In fact, by what he spoke, he had created everything that's seen. How about, how about that? Yeah, no man ever spoke like this man. I remember Brother Gibbon talking about the resurrection of Lazarus one time. He said, it's a good thing he said Lazarus. Because <laughs> otherwise, he could have emptied all the graves. Well, there's coming a day he is going to empty all the graves. No man speaks like this man. See, you've... You have, you've experienced this yourself. When you've been comforted by the Lord, you can say, no man speaks like this man. And you've, he's, he's, given you, uh, he's given you grace to stand in the evil day. You can say, no man speaks like this man. He's, he's sanctified above all that is sanctified. <clears throat> he, kept, he revealed things that were kept secret since the world began. Jesus was baptized as all of us that are in Christ or baptized into Christ. But Jesus, his baptism, my baptism is not on the same level as Jesus' baptism. I was baptized for the remission of my sins. He was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. So even in his baptism, he was, he was sanctified. He learned obedience. We have to learn obedience. But here's the difference. He didn't have to unlearn disobedience. I have to, I'm unlearning disobedience in my learning obedience. He had to learn obedience in that he was equal with God, but now he's subject to God. He humbled himself. Well, we have to humble ourselves. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. God's opposed to the proud. That'd make a good headline today, wouldn't it? God is opposed to the proud. We live in a very proud generation. We live in a proud culture. God is opposed. Well, Jesus, Jesus humbled himself, but his humility is not 
equal to my humility because when I humble myself, this is what it's like. It's like I'm just coming up to par when I humble myself. But when Jesus humbled himself, that, what, that involved emptying himself of all the prerogatives of deity. So when he humbled himself, he came down. He emptied himself to humble himself. But when I humble myself and when you humble yourself, we, we call that, that's just coming up to average. We're just coming up to speed when we humble ourselves. So, so his humility is sanctified above all other humility. So in, his, in our sanctification, we are cleansed and we're purified. In his sanctification, there was nothing to purge him from. He was sanctified among and out of what is sanctified, above all that is sanctified. We are temples of the Holy Spirit, but when it comes to Jesus, he had the Spirit without measure. So he is sanctified above. So everything that we have in Christ, we have because it's his first. It all belongs to him. He's the source of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Everything that we are in Jesus is because he is as well. <clears throat> so when God sanctified Jesus, it was not the, on the same level as God sanctifying us. Jesus is the beginning of, of sanctification and the end of sanctification. Jesus is the alpha of sanctification and the omega of sanctification. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The only reason that any of us can be sanctified is because he is sanctified, and we are sanctified in him. So God, in sanctifying Jesus, he has put the weight of his eternal purpose on Jesus. He has put the whole of his will and kingdom on Jesus. The government is on his shoulders. See, he's sanctified above all else. Jesus is doing all that the Lord has given him to do. The good pleasure of the Lord is prospering in his hand. The kingdom has never done so well as it is in Jesus' hand. Not that the kingdom has ever suffered or gone downhill, but see, the, the advancement of the kingdom is in Jesus' hand. All things are being gathered together into one, that is, in, in Jesus. It's all being gathered into him. He's the, he is sanctified. Now think about this as in, in a contrast. The angels, by the disposition of angels, the law was, was given. The angels, the angels can do can do things that none of us could even come close to doing. They're, you know, like when Jacob wrestled with an angel, you know, the angel um, he strapped himself with pretty large handicap, you know, to to make this. Uh, there, there there wouldn't be just in his natural state compared to Jacob's natural state. There wouldn't it wouldn't have been a wrestling match. In one night. An angel took out the whole army of, wasn't it, 185,000? And it's like he, he, he didn't have to break a sweat to do that. There, there wasn't uh, uh, a real challenge in what the angel was given to do uh, that night. In fact, men often thought that they were going to, they thought they were going to die when they realized they were in, a pre in the presence of an angel. This is the, see, they're, 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 they're mighty, and they're, they're, they have glory in, in them. But what Jesus is doing, the angels couldn't do. Jesus is sanctified above the angels. <clears throat> what Jesus is carrying, what he is upholding by the word of his power, the angels could not uphold. They couldn't do. What, even with everything that they did, they couldn't do what the sanctified one is doing. So all the shadows of the law, all, they were all waiting on this, on this sanctified one. The great Passover fulfilled all of these shadows. The great high priest has come that is over the, ha the house of God, and he has fulfilled all of these shadows. He is the last and effective scapegoat that has been carried out, and he himself actually is the fit man also that went out. See, he was sanctified to that word. See, all the words of the prophets that testified on him, they depended on him on this sanctified one that God would send into the world. So 
in, uh, in starting to wrap these things up, I would, I would like to report to, uh, to Moses that the prophet like unto you has come. God sanctified him and sent him into the world. And I would, I would like uh, also to tell Moses that the, the gathering has begun unto him. Unto him the gathering of the people shall be. And we've been gathered. We've been gathered, the sanctified one, to him. And I'd also like to report to Jeremiah. Now this Moses and Jeremiah and these others, they're in the great cloud of witnesses. We've been joined to them. And so I'm not just speaking into the air. I'm not just speaking parables or stories when I, when I say this. When I, I, Jeremiah, the, the righteous branch, has grown up. That righteous branch, and he is executing judgment. God has sanctified him to do this work. And I'd like to report to, to the prophet Isaiah that the, the government is resting on Jesus' shoulders. And I'd like to report to Abraham, all the nations of the earth, they are being blessed in your seed, Abraham. Because God has sanctified this one to the blessing of all people. Jesus said in the prayer, <clears throat> in the great high priesthood prayer, says, I've, I've finished the work that thou gavest me to do. See, that's sanctification. God sanctified Jesus to the work, and Jesus uh, replied, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. Nothing has fallen to the ground that Jesus has done, and it's not ever going to. No one has slipped through the cracks, and you're not going to. No part of the work has been abandoned by this one that, G that God has sanctified. Jesus is able, and Jesus is faithful, the one that God has sanctified. So I'll leave you with this thought. I like to think about Jesus and Joseph. God has set Jesus over the kingdom and sanctified him the same as Joseph. Actually, Joseph was set over Egypt because Jesus would later be set over the kingdom to save many people alive. So when Pharaoh heard that, uh, that interpretation of the dream from this man that was in his, was in his prison, I get to, there's a little short bypath. I get to wondering, did Pharaoh ever question those? Why was this man in jail? <laughs> well, that's what the world did to Jesus when he came. But when Pharaoh heard of the wisdom that Joseph had, Joseph came and heard the dream and gave him the interpretation of the dream. Joseph said, you need to set somebody over, over your kingdom that can manage these years. Otherwise, it's going to be that your kingdom's going to perish. And Pharaoh had a pretty good answer. He says, there's no man to do the work like you. And so Joseph sanctified, or Pharaoh sanctified Joseph to put him over that work. He put a ring on his finger. He put a chain of gold around his neck, and he clothed Joseph. He put him in the second chariot of the kingdom, and he had this cried out before Joseph as he was traveling around to do the work of the king. He had this cried, bow down to Joseph. And in this work that Joseph was given to do, he saved many people alive. And in this work that Jesus has been sanctified to do, he is saving many people alive.